Welcome to another edition of Lying on the Beach. I'm Steve Greenberg with Lois Whitman Hess. And as we all know, the pandemic still rages across America, but we are still lying on the beach, or at least that's what this podcast is called, and we're continuing to do it. And with some great information about the this pandemic, we have a, a terrific guest today that will give us a lot of insight. Uh, she is a physician, but we'll talk about that in a moment. I want to point out that lying on the beach is only possible because we are powered by the handle stick, the must-have phone accessory that adds stylish jewelry and usability to your smartphone. And let's talk about what we're all thinking about 24-7, which is uh, COVID-19. And Dr. Susan Malinowski is a retinal surgeon and an inventor and a partner in the Retina Consultants of Michigan. Dr. Mal was born in uh, Warsaw, Poland, and she grew up in the Detroit area. She does research, writes, lectures worldwide on new treatments for blinding retinal illnesses. She's also a patent holder and inventor of the Roller Baby, which is a stroller suitcase combo. Also the Pre-Stick, which is a caliper that eases pain during interocular injections, and an instrument used to deliver medications under the uh, under the retina during retinal surgery. So she's really uh, got a lot, a lot going on there. She's obviously super smart. And it's interesting to note that, of course, she's, what she does, she does retina work, which is about infections. And as we were talking earlier, the first doctors to identify this novel virus were eye doctors. So she has a special insight, but I think she should give us more. She just did an amazing paper about this virus. And I think start off saying about why you feel there's a connection between what you do, which is not really um, public health so much, I, I mean, as a public health specialist, but as a, a retina specialist, but how is that connected to this? And why did you feel this paper was so, so up your alley to write? Thank you so much, Steve Lois. It's wonderful to be talking with you today. Um, I think there's multiple reasons why I felt I had to say something. Um, first and foremost, I'm fortunate enough to be a doctor and any doctor in any specialty deals with infections and we have uh, and have to have an understanding of how infections are spread. And for this particular virus, there's been spread through contact uh, in the eye and uh, patients who have pink eye or pink eye-like symptoms can spread this disease. So there's a lot of interest in it. Uh, in my uh, uh, ophthalmic community. In addition to that, I've had uh, the great fortune to travel to China many times, and I've seen uh, how healthcare is delivered there. I've seen how people live there. And so when I heard the news back in January about Wuhan uh, being shut down, I knew that we had a much bigger problem. And I tried to tell people, tried to share my insight, and unfortunately, I didn't write about it. I think that we are at the beginning of another important crossroad, and so that was why I said, okay, this time I'm going to try to do something more about it and say something. And also, uh, I've heard so much helplessness from people that I wanted to give them some hope and some direction. So my article focuses on the big picture and also on what uh, individuals can do at home to uh, move from helplessness to hope. And I think that's why I did it at this time. Dr. Mao, how, how do people find your article? So um, it's on Medium, and uh, there have been uh, multiple links on Facebook, Twitter. Uh, everyone has been reposting it. I've, I've been amazed that as of this morning, there have been 40,000 views, and it's been out since uh, late Thursday afternoon. So. Uh, just uh, a little bit over 48 hours. So what are the main questions that you get from people after they read your piece? So it's interesting. It's not so much questions as it is uh, that they seem to understand where we're headed. And I think that's really the main thrust of the article is talking about the importance of this antibody testing. And right. uh, the individuals that have responded have asked, what can we do to get the antibody testing? So some people have sent it to their uh, local representatives. Some people have tried to send it to the media uh, to try to get that issue out there because I feel that we missed a, a window of opportunity with the testing for the virus. And now the window of opportunity is the antibody testing. And it's so crucial to get us out of our homes. 
So don't you feel that the in this situation, it seems like the federal government is sort of dropping the ball. They have like about six weeks now until, you know, maybe the stay at home is, is, is starting to ease up. And to get us back into moving, which seems to be what they want so much, wouldn't we be pulling together 300 million uh, samples of that serology antibody test so that we could be finding out who is able to go back and isn't at risk? That could be found out so Simply, it's a test that's already happening in Germany. It's happening in other parts of the world. Why aren't we in a more uh, proactive mode here? I think that's the question, and I have a couple of answers, I think. Um, okay. But backing up to what happened with the initial testing, I'm not a person who normally screams at the television, but I found myself screaming when I heard that the CDC was controlling the testing. They, at that point, we should have had multiple tests in multiple cities. You can't get behind this. You have to get in front of it. And right now, the problem with the antibody testing uh, is that it's not available here in a way that works. So, for example, just a few days ago, a company called Celex, C-E-L-L-E-X, uh, they announced that they were the first FDA-approved test in the United States. The problem is this is a Chinese company, and they have a U.S. office, but as far as I can tell, the U.S. office is an empty lot. And the problem is, is that the tests coming out of China, whether it's uh, cultural, whether it's a quality control issue, whether it's a different strain of the virus, the tests may not be valid here. And uh, in the last few days, we've heard the horror stories coming out of Spain and coming out of Italy, where they purchase these Chinese-made tests, and they're only about 20 to 30 percent accurate. That's bad. And, and, oh, God. But, but this is not a, a really, a, I mean, this test, this kind of test has been around forever. I can't believe there's I mean, why can't Johnson & Johnson or one of the other large companies, uh, AstraZeneca or whatever, come out with, hey, this is, we're going to crank out our own version of the test. It's, it's basically a test that's been around forever. An antigen test is, is nothing new. Why aren't we revving up here and just going crazy producing this test so that's it's sitting in every Walgreens in America? I don't understand why that's not happening. Well, I, again, I think it's multifactorial, but I think, Steve, that is the big issue and the big question, and again, a, a big impetus why I wrote this article, because I want people to understand what's going on. And uh, I'll give you an example. There's a company in Florida called uh, Milo One, who uh, they have an antibody-based test. They are missing the cellulose sponge to make the test. Oh, my gosh. So in speaking with uh, the head of the company, he said that he has contacted multiple companies here in the United States, and a lot of them are shut down because they're not considered essential or their employees are afraid or whatever the cause is, the companies are shut down. They cannot find a source for the cellulose sponge to make the antibody test kit. Now again, this is something that the administration should be intervening and they should be saying, you know, we are going to open these factories and we are going to help you to make this test kit. And then the other problem is that we're sending these kits out, I, the ones that they can make because, you know, the CE regulations were such that they were allowed there before they were allowed here. Now, again, the FDA has relaxed the regulations and I think that's good and bad. I think it's great for companies that have the test, that are validating the test, that are using a US-based serum to create the test so that we have the correct strain of virus that we're testing for. Right, the downside right. of it is that we're gonna allow these Chinese-made test kits to come into the country that at least in Spain and Italy, and in the, actually there was also another article that just came out out of the Czech Republic, 20 to 30% accuracy. Well, you might as well be flipping a coin. You got a 50-50 yeah. chance. All right, so we're gonna do oh. these tests and we don't know what what we're, what kind of test results we're really getting. So, and again, these are taxpayer dollars. They're going to pay for these test kits. So I, 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 don't, just, I don't understand. I don't, and why aren't we getting it? Why aren't we taking Johnson & Johnson? Or I mean, I, I, I can't think of all my big farm companies, but we have a zillion big farm companies. Uh, why aren't we forcing them, using maybe the Defense Protection Act, to say, look, you have to do this. This is your thing. We will pay for it, but you need to do it. Why isn't that happening? I just don't understand. It seems uh, it seems pretty obvious uh, as an associate here. I don't understand why the, the the government's not doing that. 
I don't really understand it either, other than maybe the agencies are overwhelmed. I think they're trying to do the right thing, but I think this is the next big tidal wave that's going to hit us. I really to, believe that. To, and to the me, only way I, to... I feel like the government is looking, you know, and this is how I, I feel like, you know, when you're in charge of something, you can look three days ahead, which is important because those three days are important, but you have to have, you know, your headlights on and you have to look down the road a little bit. And this is not looking that far. The next thing we're going to need, we should have had tests to see if you had the virus, but now we need to, need to now we need to find out who has uh, some um, immunity to it and who doesn't. And the only way to do that is by rolling out a huge amount of these antigen tests. And I just don't understand why it's so clear to anyone who, who's, you know, there's so many people around in the federal government who have a public health degree and whatnot, why they aren't saying this is what we should be doing. We should probably bring our efforts into finding out, especially if you want to roll up, roll out the economy eventually, you need to know who can go back out and who can't. I, it doesn't exactly. make any sense to me. Exactly. Dr. Mel, do you have any, yeah. any, any um, uh, suggestions for the general public on how we could make our voices heard on this issue? Well, I think that what's happened so far is, is just passing the information along, even something as, as small as my article and passing it to others and spreading it and contacting your, your representatives and making some noise about this. And I think what we want to push for is to help the companies here to make these test kits and get them into the into the public. And I don't think it's any one company. I think we need multiple companies. No, right. no, one, no one company is going to create enough kits for all of us. But the test is so simple. It's 15 minutes. It's a single, it's a single a pinprick like you would uh, check for a blood sugar. And you have an answer in 15 minutes. It's simple. It's easy. And then and once it, we... Once we take the test, what happens after that? Which so is the when way? You, yeah, go ahead. So when you take the test, basically they, they all work on the same mechanism, which is to detect antibodies. You have two types of antibodies. You have what are called IgG and IgM antibodies. IgM antibodies are typically produced within days of an infection. And those are the antibodies that say, I was just infected and I'm getting over it now. An IgG antibody can last for months and months and it says that you had the infection in the past. And at least in theory, and of course we don't have years of experience with this virus, but comparing it to SARS, comparing it to simple flu, once you have an IgG antibody, it, you have immunity to at least this particular strain for a very, very long time, months and months and months. And so it would buy us time until we had a vaccine that would then you know, certainly help the rest of the population. So it tells you that you at least have been exposed and you have gotten over the infection and you can get back out there. So you don't think that people can get this twice? Well, there's a lot of controversy on that because there have mm. been reports uh, of people who have been quote unquote reinfected. But the problem is we don't know if maybe the first time there was a problem with the testing, the second time around there was problem with the testing. And those are anecdotal reports, right? I mean, it's it's the same thing as saying, you know, nobody is allergic to something, but then you find one person who's allergic to something that you would never expect, like a piece of plastic. Right. Anything's possible, but you have to, in this situation where you're dealing with such a crisis and a pandemic, look at the big picture. And the majority of people who have been infected appear to not be susceptible anymore. And of course, you know, only time will tell, but certainly you have to assume and you don't have the luxury of waiting years and years and doing lots of uh, wide scale studies, but you have to assume that it's similar to other illnesses that people get and the way immunity is, is created in the body. And also that there's some cross reactivity with similar strains of that virus. So I think that's the best that we can go on right now. And we have to assume that even if, it, even if it's for a few months, that you're, uh, you have some immunity. It may not be a lifetime. It may not be years and years, but it's just a few months. That still gives us some time to, to work on finding a vaccine, get some, get more. You know, we're going to be short on people who can help those in the hospitals. Those people who do have some immunity for a short time, even can at least go on the front lines of helping to fight and help patients out. It, it would, it would free up a lot of people to then go back into society. Maybe others of us might have to still stay you know, locked away for a while until there's a vaccine, but at least it would help us know who can go out and who can't. 
And, and, and I right. can't imagine why we aren't moving faster on this. And well, how, does that, how does that communications work? Once we have the test, what do we carry around little cards that we're fail safe? Well, I I'm not sure how we would carry it on. Maybe you would have it on your smartphone and it would give the results of the last test. Um, some of these test uh, kits that are available, they send the results to the cloud and it's stored there. So your results could be accessible if you wanted it to, to be uh, to anybody. Do you but think I certain think... people would kick back on this because of privacy situations that people that have to get out, they don't care what they have, they still, you know, they're still very aggressive about uh, breaking the rules? There's always going to be those people in society, but I, I truly believe that in general people want to do what's right and they want to help and they want to uh, help others. And so I think that those people, I think, would, would triumph over the others. I really believe that. And also, just one last point about the antibody testing, and, and Steve brought up a good point. How long do the antibodies last? Well, because of the ease of the test, and also, let's not forget the cost, which is very, very cost effective. The average price right now is about $10 for one of these tests. You could repeat it in a few months. Right, easily. Right. right. So see if the person still has the antibodies. So it's it's and, and we probably need to do that because it's it's a way of doing a, a big scale public health study to say, okay, we can see that after four months you're still protected. After uh you know, ten months you're still protected. And and we we'll, we can keep seeing it and we start seeing it, the protection going down in the population, then we know, uh oh, this is where this is heading and, and then warnings have to go out. But it's all it all can be managed on a big scale if we start doing this, but right now is the perfect time to be mass producing these antibody tests. And I don't hear anything about that happening. I don't, it's not, it, it should be, um, I guess some monster pharmaceutical company here in the US or several, many of them should be, should be cranking it out and it's not happening. But again, I think that sometimes the obvious just doesn't happen just as back in, at the end of January, beginning of February, we should have been making these kits to detect where the virus outbreaks right. were occurring, and we didn't do that either. But also, this is something that we've not had to deal with since 1917, and so I don't think we were as prepared as we should have been. And no one, you know, no one's able to to deal with the the, the mass scale of this right now. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't focus on the few things that are going to be very important. And I think this is at the top of the list. And then in the meantime, people can do things on their own to try to make their lives better. Like I said, I talked about in the article some very simple things like opening the windows, wearing a mask when you go out, which the CDC just finally reversed uh, its uh, position on that yesterday. Uh, those are just simple things that people can do on their own. And then there's lots of, you know, really great stories coming out all over, you know, people trying to help however they can, whether it's delivering meals to uh, doctors and, and first frontline responders working in hospitals. There's just a lot that people can do. And I think a lot of the frustration that people have is just this feeling of helplessness that I can't do anything. But I think we can. And if you're sitting home, write your congressman and say, we need to help our companies here in the United States make these antibody tests, period. We're going to do our, we're going to do our, by, pu by pushing out your article. I thought, I mean, about the antibody testing, I thought it was fascinating what you had to say, and also the air circulation. And I turned around and I saw that my husband opened up the window, you know, that he had it open. And I'm like, oh, thank God. He, he knew the right thing to do. Because, I, I mean, hospitals really have to take a look at, you know, your thoughts on that. Right. And unfortunately, you know, everyone has the best intentions. And everybody, including hospital systems and, and new modern hospitals, we have these wonderful airflow systems. And of course, if you're living in a cold climate, it's harder to open the windows. I understand all that. But if you have the ability, um, I think that, you know, the research that was shown back in 2007, which is, uh, it, ironically enough, they were looking at ways to mitigate influenza pandemics. That's what the point of the research was. They found that there certainly was a much lower rate of spread of infection just by opening the windows. And in the influenza what about pandemic... It? I can see that in a hospital where you have a lot of mix of people and at least the, the breeze kind of like dilutes the air. But let's say you're in a home. It's just you and you and your partner. You, you, if there it's a closed environment. So is, it, is, it, is keeping it closed a, still a problem or still opening a window make a difference? 
Well, the, as, as you know, there are felt to be many asymptomatic carriers or people who have had very mild infection and then mm-hmm. uh, possibly got over it. I may be one of those people. Unfortunately, I can't be tested. I've tried. And so if you have any chance that you could be a carrier, asymptomatic, or someone who has recovered, you don't want to infect the other people in your home. Open the window. Yeah. It's a simple thing. Yeah. So the answer to that, Steve, is yes. Open your window. Yes, right? yes. <laughs> Open the window. Okay. Right. And that's Not also, again, why, this, you know, why it's felt that this infection has spread the way it has because of all the individuals walking around who are carriers that don't know it and have no symptoms or minimal symptoms. And that's why the face masks, again, from the beginning, I think should have been a mandate, not the N95, not the hospital worker level of face mask, but a face mask that protects you from giving it to others in case you're one of those carriers. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Steve, time for a commercial? Absolutely, this is a time for, on on that note, but sure, masks are important, but so is also the handle stick. So uh, and that's what's important because that's our sponsor and they power lying on the beach. A handle stick is a must-have phone accessory that adds stylish smoothly and usability to your smartphone. It attaches directly to the back of your existing smartphone or the case that you use right now. You don't need to switch out the case. It uh, it utilizes a brace system so you can effortlessly grip your phone, whether you're speaking or texting or even taking self- selfies. It feels like the phone is literally floating in your hand, and selfie allows the complete one-handed use of your phone, so it frees up the other hand for multitasking. And the handle stick has a kickstand on it, so you can either stand the phone up uh, landscape or portrait mode. And these days, we're doing so much uh, video conferencing and FaceTime and Skype and whatnot. It's kind of a must-have. And yes, you can wirelessly charge through the handle stick. It comes in more than 40 styles, including uh, animal prints, lots of color, uh, fun glitter, sophisticated carbon fiber patterns, and the handle stick cost starts at, at just, get this, $10. You can check it out at handle, H-A-N-D-L, New York, spelled out, dot com. Handle, New York, dot com. And if you're going to order something, this is the way to go, because frankly, uh, I do so much video conferencing and Skyping and whatnot, you got to have a handle stick on your phone. So um, on that note, let's return back to Dr. Mal. And if you had to tell uh, listeners one thing, Dr. Mal, what would it be? Let's get the word out there about the need for the antibody testing. Post it on social media, call your congressman, help, and prepare and help. Dr. Mal, in all your years of practicing, and even when you were being educated, did you ever think anything like this would ever happen? I feel like we're in the twilight zone, and the unknown is just, you know, horrendous. Uh, I know that, you know, we, we watch these things in the movies or on television, but could you predict anything like this? I would have never predicted it, but I also remember learning first about HIV and AIDS when we didn't understand it. And look how far we've come in helping people and letting individuals who have those infections live lives that are wonderful. And I truly believe that as Americans, we have the ability to do it again. I came here from Poland. We came with $20 in my pocket. My parents are Holocaust survivors. And this country has given me so much and so much opportunity. And I've got to meet so many wonderful people from so many different walks of life that know how to think outside of the box and have that working, hardworking spirit and entrepreneurial spirit. And I believe that we will overcome this again. Mm, amazing. Um, <clears throat> and, in, and in some ways, I, I think it's worth noting that this is almost, because I, I, I had a, a master's in public health, so I kind of took public health 101 a year, million years ago. But this is like textbook. What's ha- what we're experiencing is exactly what, you know, was predicted would happen eventually and is happening almost to the letter of how these things spread, that it's usually respiratory, all of that. It's just, it's just amazing to me how you read something, you think, oh, well, that's just, you know, whatever. It's just, and then it actually is exactly as predicted in some ways. So it is kind of amazing. It is amazing. But again, I think we can't miss this window of opportunity. And I, I can't stress it enough to all of your listeners to, to make some noise and uh, to help the companies here to make these tests that are valid, 
and uh, available. Dr. Mel, do you think this is the beginning of more infections like this that's going to happen? Like this is going to be much more common based on this flu situation? Like <clears throat> this, is not, this is not the end. We just don't cure this and, and we walk away. I think, unfortunately, I think to some extent you're right. I think we'll learn mm -hmm. from this. And the action that we take in the next few weeks will determine how we look in the next few months. And years, so we, right? Right. So we have, a, we have the opportunity here to make a difference and, mm. to, and to get us going down a different path. We absolutely do. But if well, we don't do this, then we're, we're going to have some very serious problems. That's why your article is very, very important. And uh, we are going to circulate it around a lot. And uh, we're going to have to bring up some of the points that you make that are further down because, unfortunately, a lot of journalists just read the lead and the headline. <laughs> so we're going to – I mean, you rolled it out beautifully. It just came right off Thank the you. tongue. And it was, a, it was a very good read, even for pedestrians like me. However – we need we need the world to know about this because this is definitely part of the cure. So we'll figure that out. Uh, Steve, uh, do we have anything else? I'm sure you have a no. I, question. I think I think just the point that I think we should emphasize as mm -hmm. someone has that this you know, any of our listeners uh, should get out there and contact their senators, their their house reps, whoever they can reach out to to say, look, we want to see antibody testing rolled out in a big way fast. And we should use the Defense Power Act or whatever it takes to make that happen. Agreed, Dr. Mao? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So on that note, I think, uh, Dr. Mao, thank you so much for your insight. We appreciate it. Uh, this has been really, uh, I think, eye-opening, not because you're an eye doctor. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure she's I, heard I, that I, before. <laughs> I, I use the word insight. It's kind of put it in. Again, thank yes, you very you much too. for your help. We appreciate it. And um, once again, uh, thank you. And I'm Steve Greenberg with Lois Whitman Hess. And we have been lying on the beach. So long, thank everybody. Thank you.